Hey, y'all, how you doing? All right, all right, all right. Now, three, a quick announcement before I jump in. Three things I don't want to remind you of, okay? Three things I want to remind you of, okay? Number one, we have a celebration going on on May the, May the 16th. That's right, May 16th, and you need to do three things. Number one is get a ticket. Tell your neighbor, get a ticket. Okay, and if you get a ticket, show up because we're going to have food for you, so don't leave us hanging with the food, all right? So number one, get a ticket. Tell me again, get a ticket. Number two, bring a chair. Tell your neighbor, bring a chair. All right, and number three, number three, carpool. Tell your neighbor, say carpool. carpool. And you got to carpool because, folks, listen, we've handed out between 12 and 1,800 of these tickets already, so we need you to carpool, all right? So, so do that for us, all right? want to let you know about that. Now, in the book of James, let's jump back into the letter that James writes to the church, to the Jewish church that is scattered among the nations, all right? Let's jump back into that. Remember, let's go back, remember, that James does not write this letter in chapter and verse. So even as we go through it verse by verse by verse, and I'm reading every verse as we go through, even as we do that, it's a bit lost on us because I'm doing it one chapter at a time. If you got a letter from somebody that you really cared about or, or who you really expected or whom you really respected, you would not read it one page. Oh, I'm finished with this page today. Put it down and then come back to it tomorrow. You wouldn't do it that way you would read it from beginning to end in one sitting well that's the way they read it so I've got to keep catching you up because if you don't stay in context if you don't stay in the letter you'll get lost just looking at one chapter standing alone by itself or one verse standing alone by itself and you can't do that and understand the epistle or the letter of James so remember we started out with we started out with a brave faith because we talked about a faith that was brave enough, a faith that was brave enough to endure. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. You remember that. We worked our way through all the way to a faith that was brave enough to get involved. Religion, brothers and sisters, that God finds as pure and faultless as this, to take, after widow, to take care of widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You remember these words, right? So that's where we started and ended. And then again, pause keep oneself being polluted by the world, pause, and we move into chapter 2. And chapter 2 is not about a brave faith. It's about a living faith, which means that if we are going to take care of widows and orphans in their distress and not be polluted by the world, that will only occur if we have a faith that is alive. And a faith without deeds is dead because if our faith has no deeds, then our faith makes no difference. You need to know that. You need to unpack that. If our faith has no deeds, our faith makes no difference. If we don't put deeds to our faith, then we cannot take care of widows and orphans in their distress. You see that, right? And if, we're, if our faith is not active, we will not keep ourselves from being polluted by the world because we're not exercising or practicing our faith. So all of that comes together to give us a living faith. Then we talked last week, chapter 3, about a spoken faith. Watch, watch, watch. Find the courage to endure and get involved in your faith. Put your faith to work. And then as God is changing through your courage and your action, the way your heart works, the way your mind thinks, and the words that naturally well up out, out from inside of you, then your words will clean up as well because your words are the hardest thing you'll ever clean up. See? See how it's building on itself? Today we're going to go a step deeper. Today we're going to jump into chapter 4. But before I can get you to understand chapter 4, i got to redefine some words for you. And I'd like to do that by taking you all the way back to the Old Testament. Remember that James is, is one of the 12, and he is, he, is, he is highly committed to a Jewish form of life. In fact, James is the one who brings, who brings some type of balance between Paul, who would, who would do away with the law entirely and, and just start completely over in, in, a, in an era of grace, and the Judaizers who would make all Christians follow 
uh, Jewish law and somehow adhere to all points of Jewish law. There's this debate in Acts. And what we know is that James and Peter together are the ones that bring a, a, a successful conclusion to that debate. James is very committed to his Jewish roots and yet understands that the blood of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the sacrifice of Christ changes everything. And so James is thinking back. He's consistently hearkening back to the Old Testament. So let me show you something. The, the prophet Micah, in chapter 6 of the book that, that, that bears his name, and verse 8, we read these words. God is speaking to the nation of Israel. God is speaking to his children. Listen to me. God is speaking to us. And in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he says this. He has shown you, God, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Listen to it. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, here's the reason I've got to go here in order to set up for James chapter 4. It's the fact that this word justly, mercy, and the word humbly are all misused in our current English version. They're all misused in our language. I don't know if you realize this, but words in today's language are very fluid things. Their meanings change. And this, this was not always so, but it's very definitively so in today's culture, in today's Western culture. Words shift meaning very quickly. In our, in our vernacular, in our language, these three words mean something very different than they meant to Micah and mean something very different than they meant to James. When I use the word act justly, that clearly says something to you. It says you should act in a way that is right. That makes sense to you, right? Here's the problem. That word defined as act justly is the root word for what we use for the term justice. And quite frankly, James is going to deal with the idea of justice in chapter 4. Now, listen to me. Everybody hear me. In our modern culture, this word justice means vengeance. In our modern culture, this word justice means you got to do to them what they do. In our modern culture, this word justice actually has come to mean an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But here's the problem. Jesus died on a cross to set us free from an eye for, for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This word justice in our culture has come to mean this. You got to get even. You got you to make somebody pay. That's what the word justice means in our culture. Can I tell you, there is an element of that in the Hebrew language and in the Greek language when you were, use the word justice. But it is the smallest element of the meaning of the word. The word justice in a biblical construct does not mean vengeance. In fact, God's clear. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not yours. The word justice in a biblical context means what Micah says, to act justly. It means what you do, not what you do to someone else. You see the difference you have to understand that, or else we won't be able to walk properly into James chapter 4. Secondly, this word mercy. Well, in, in our culture, the word mercy probably carries the same connotation it does biblically, which means if I show mercy, I forgive somebody. But it has a very different feeling to us than perhaps it did in the first century or in the Old Testament. Because the feeling to us of mercy is, if I show mercy, I have to lose. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with how we view mercy. We view mercy as in, oh, it's all right, no, no bad, no, no harm, no foul. We're, we view mercy that way. When mercy is nothing more than showing grace when it is not deserved. The definition of this term mercy, the definition of this term grace is, un, is undeserved forgiveness. Undeserved favor that's the idea mercy does not say you didn't do anything wrong 
And that's how we feel it in our culture today, but that's incorrect. Mercy says, you messed up, I'm going to forgive you anyway. See that? See the difference in those two? So I, I need you to understand it that way. And the last one is walk humbly before your God. We see humility as weakness. Our culture views humility as weakness. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Each of you should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be demanded or grasped after. But in humility, he humbled him. Wait, wait, can I show you this? Jesus is by no means weak. He is the creator. Listen, by dying on that cross, he won a war. We didn't even have the ability to fight. Jesus is the definition of powerful. Jesus is the definition of strong. Jesus is the definition of in charge. And yet he showed humility. You see how we've misdefined all three of these? We have to understand them properly. So watch. Act justly. That has to do with you and your actions, not everybody else's. Love, mercy, love extending grace even and especially when it's not deserved. And walk humbly in strength, in power, but without demanding that you have a special place. Walk humbly before God. You understand those, right? Everybody's got that. Now watch. Let's go back to chapter 4. James chapter 4. Watch what he says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Did you know that God is in charge of all timing? Did you realize that? Do you realize that this sermon was set for this weekend in September of 2014? I need you to understand that. I need you to know that this sermon, this chapter, was set to be preached on this day in September of 2014. Because I'm about to tread where angels fear. And I need you to pray for me, okay? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Do you hear something echoing in your ears from chapter 1? When you are tempted, don't say God tempted you. For each one is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desires. See him repeating himself? Tie it right back to chapter 1. The, the, you, you, quarrels and fights are caused by, they come from your own desires that battle within you. He's back talking about this again. Remember, it's not he's back talking about it. It's one letter. Don't they come from your own desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't get mad at me. I'm going to say this in the context that it is in the Old Testament. You dirty skanks. And don't hear this as something I said to the women. All y'all. Sorry. All us. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Listen to what he says. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that he, God, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell within us? What is that spirit? Being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be, be demanded, but humbled himself and took the very nature of a servant, the very nature of a human, and became obedient even to the point of death. I don't have it all in there, but you get the point. He yearns for that. He jealously longs for that spirit to show through us. But he gives us, somebody say amen before I even read it. 
He gives us more grace. He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. I need you to know that in our world today, I hear Christians constantly, all week, I was at a conference this week as the events in Baltimore unfolded. And Tina and I watched, ready to at any moment book a ticket and come home if we needed to. We watched as those events unfolded, and, and I heard people begin, the Christians, begin to cry for justice. And I, I, please hear me out. Please, please hear me out, okay? Don't turn me off when I start. At least hear me out. And if you don't like what I say at the end, you can turn me off then, okay? But please hear me out. It breaks my heart when I hear Christians in that moment calling for justice. Justice, hear me, please hear me. I understand what we're calling for. I understand what we're calling for. But justice won't bring peace unless the justice is applied individually to me. Watch, watch, let's move this backwards. Let's move this backwards. To, to, to live justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Watch, if I walk humbly, Not then, only then, only in humility can I love mercy. Pride does not love mercy. I hear people sometimes say that folks that are in trouble, what we need to give them is pride. Not so. Pride is not the answer. Pride is the enemy. Because pride is not what, if, if Jesus had decided that pride was what we needed, he would have come and demanded his seat. He said he knew that oh, humility was what, needed, what was needed because only in humility can we love mercy. Pride, pride demands vengeance. But humility loves mercy. Watch, watch, I want to show you something. If I could learn, if I could learn, and, and we'll talk about me, okay? If the shoe fits, you put it on, but I'm going to talk about me. If I could learn to walk humbly, then I could have the capacity to love mercy. Then I could have the capacity in my humility to act justly by looking at the moment and saying, this is truly wrong. Wait. Could it somehow be my fault? Maybe I'm not acting justly. And suddenly humility allows us to love mercy, which allows us to live justly and see justice as something that's about me, not someone else. And peace comes as a result. I know you may not agree with me, but I'm begging you to unpack what the Bible has to say about this. Listen to me. Jesus died for all lives. Amen. Jesus died for all people. All lives matter. From conception to grave, all lives matter. But in our pride, we're demanding some above others. And until we learn to walk humbly, we'll not be able to love mercy, which will leave us incapable of acting justly. Amen. I need you to hear this. My heart breaks. I know yours does too. My heart breaks in these moments. But I'm here to tell you that a humble faith is the answer to this problem. And God timed this sermon for this week. 
Verse 7. With all of what we've just said in mind, listen to what he says. Submit yourselves then to God. Submit yourselves then to God. Look at your neighbor and say, submit to God. Submit yourselves then to God. Watch. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Somebody say amen. Amen. See, some of us think that there's no hope for us against the devil. But you got to see what James says. Resist the devil. Wait. Submit to God and resist the devil. The devil is bigger and badder than you are. Everybody knows that, right? Don't run out of here and try to pick a fight with the devil. He's bigger than you. Okay? But he is not bigger than God. It is not that we are stronger than the devil. It is that the one standing behind us freaks the devil out because he's already whooped him. Do you see what I'm saying? So what we've got to understand is watch. Submit to God and then in your submission to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. See that? Let me keep reading. That's not even the point. Let me keep reading. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Amen? Amen. You know, some people, where is God? Well, look, you got to be working and coming near to him. He always wants to be near to you, but you have to set yourself in such a mode that you experience him. Okay, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Everybody's got that? That's the altar call, if you will. All right, so that's what we got to do. Change your laughter to mourning. I'm sorry, verse 9. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Everybody always wonders, what's that all about? Do Christians have to be a sad sack? And the answer is no, we don't. It's that if we, look, look, look. Sin should crush you. The very idea that you hurt the heart of God should turn your laughter to mourning should turn your joy to grieving. The very idea, look, let me tell you something. Look, what we call fun in this world, what we call points that bring laughter and bring joy in this world are actually often sinful. Because remember, I told you, definitions of words change and our society has messed up words. So when we say party and we think of what will make us laugh and have fun, when I use that, look, if I just say we're going to party, most of you don't hear things in your head that are right. And so as a result, watch, what once we defined as bringing laughter should now cause grieving. What once we defined as fun should now cause mourning. You see this? See the juxtaposition of the two? Sin should crush us because it breaks the heart of God. you got to understand that. That's hard to live out. That's hard to live out. But I need you to have that in your head. I need you to shift your thinking that way. Keep reading, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Say amen. Amen. Say it louder. Because I'm going to tell you something. We're always trying to lift ourselves up, and I can only lift me up that high. You see what I'm saying? In, In this screen, only this high. But you see what I'm saying, right? I can only lift me up so high. But God, how far could he lift me up? And if I want him to lift me up, all I got to do is humble myself. Oh, say amen again. That's good stuff right there. All right, humble humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. I want to teach you something here. We must have, watch, we must have a decided humility. Let, let, Let me tell you what I mean by this. Humility is chosen, it is not inborn. Okay, humility is not what is natural. Yes, some people are born with more meekness than others. Some people are born quieter than others. But just because someone is meek and quiet doesn't mean they're not prideful. Because I know a lot of quiet people that are really prideful. You know, and so, so we got to understand, we got to understand meekness and humility are not necessarily the same thing. Quietness and humility are not necessarily... Look, you can be born meek. You can be born quiet. This is part of your personality. But nobody's personality is naturally humble. Humility is chosen. You have to choose it. Watch. Look what he says. He says, verse 7, Submit yourselves. That's a choice you make on your own. Watch, go back, go back, verse 6. But he gives us more grace, say amen. Amen. 
This, that is why scripture says God humbles, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then. You see that? We have to choose humility. We must choose to be humble. It's a decided thing. It's a chosen thing. Our culture tells us that choosing to be humble is a bad idea. But how many times do I have to tell you that our culture's got this all messed up? Our culture leads us to hate one another. Our culture leads us to fight one another. And I'm not just talking about the events in Baltimore. I could be talking about businesses. I could be talking about business dealings. I could be talking about dating relationships. I could be talking about marriages. I could be talking about families. I could be talking about the painting on your mama's wall when she passes away and all the kids fight over it. Our culture leads us to fight each other and allows for it. And it's natural to us because our own desires cause us to go to war with each other. We don't have what we want, so we kill. We don't get what we want, so we fight. God says live in humility. And this humility, walk humbly before our God. I'm going to say it again. Will allow us to love mercy. And loving mercy will, will teach us how to act justly. You see it? Well, I just keep reading. Decided humility. Now, now keep reading. Verse 11. Brothers and sisters. You remember, we're in the same thought, so stay with it. Stay with the thought. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Can I just say amen to that? Come on now. Do not slander one another. Can I tell you, the, the, the devil has a heyday with us because we spend so much time bashing each other, he don't even have to work hard. Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister and judges them speaks against the law and judges it. You say, well, then who is to judge? Listen to me. The judge is to judge, not you. And that may be, that I, I could apply that, I could apply that earthly. It's the judge's job to judge, not you. You say, well, I know what the right thing is. How do you know? Well, I just know. How do you know? Did you research it? Did, 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 you go, did you go undo the crime scene? I mean, I don't care what it is. If it's a business dealing, if, it, if it's a relationship, if it, if it, whatever it, the situation is, you don't understand everything about another person. You can't. Nobody else understands everything about you. And when you stand in judgment on another brother or sister... Quite frankly, you stand, the Bible says it, you stand in judgment against the law. And you judge the law. You say, what you're saying is, I understand this law and you're confused. And folks, that is, listen, that is so arrogant. I have a take on doctrine. I think I understand how God works in some cases. But I'm not about to tell you that your viewpoint on it, as long as it has a biblical base, is wrong. You know why? Because my mind is not big enough to encompass the reality of who my God is. And I thank God that he's bigger than my brain can comprehend. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Not judging my neighbor requires humility. Only, I'm going to say it again, only when I'm walking humbly before my God can I love mercy enough to apply grace even when I don't think it's deserved? And then act justly because I'm worried about me and how I live rather than trying to make you right. How many times in Scripture does the Bible teach this? Jesus, in one of his parables, says, Stop worrying about the plank in your, stop worrying about the splinter in your brother's eye while you got a big old plank sticking out of yours. 
The imagery is just that vivid. He says, you're freaking out over the, over the little splinter. That little, little splinter in your brother's eye. Dude, do you realize you got a two by four by ten hanging out yours? That's the imagery. And we do this. We do this constantly. Because we're convinced we know what's right. We're, y'all, I love you. I love you. We're so arrogant that we think we know what's right. And we demand that everybody act on what we know because we know. And we don't know nothing. Only God knows the heart of a human being. Uh, sometimes people will come to me at a funeral and they'll say, is so-and-so in heaven? And I, 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 I'm not, I often won't deal with that question. There are sometimes I'm very clear with saying, oh, yes, because I watched this person live their lives. And oh, my word. But often when they ask me that question, it's not that moment. It's the moment when the lifestyle or the last choices made you ask the question. My answer is always the same. I lean on the heart of a righteous and gracious and merciful God. I trust him. (laughs) I tend to think there's going to be a whole lot more people in heaven than some of us think. I tend to think some of us are going to show up, and the first thing, first, I don't know, I'm hoping God will just redeem us and this won't happen, but if he doesn't, the first thought in our mind is going to go, oh, he got here. <laughs> oh, my word, that must have been a deathbed confession. I'm hoping God redeems our hearts before we wake up on the other side. You know what I'm saying? And we just wake up and go, Wah! and that's all there is to it. You know, so anyway. Watch. We must have a decided humility. We must have an obedient humility. We must obey God's word. We must obey God in such a way that we're not trying to judge other people with the law. We're trying to take the good news and the law of God's word and use it as a mirror up against ourselves. Do you see that? It's an obedient humility. It's a humility that says, I'm going to take this law and use it as a grid to judge me, not you. It's a humility that says, I'm going to show you how to walk this life by walking it myself, but I'm not going to try to force you into the construct that is who I am. I remember, do y'all know how weird it gets when we try to make these little rules like this? We used to have a rule at youth camp. Girls couldn't, I mean, when they finally let the girls wear shorts, girls couldn't wear shorts that didn't go beyond their hands, their fingertips. Well, what if a poor girl has short arms? Or really long arms. See how stupid it gets when we try to do that? Just stop it. Walk humbly. Love mercy. I'm going to keep saying it backwards. Because when we walk humbly, then we have the capacity to love mercy. Which gives us the ability to act justly. Watch, 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 watch. Verse 13. Now listen. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. What you do, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your own arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. All such boasting is evil. Now, 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 listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. This, this, this statement, what is your life? It's a vapor. You're just, you're just passing through this statement. Listen to me very clearly. This statement is not designed to cause despondency in you. This is not there to depress you. It's not there to say, oh, my life is just so short and it don't mean nothing. That's not what he's saying to you. 
It's not there to create despondency. It's there to create urgency. And we need an urgent humility. A humility that understands that my life is just passing. And I got to get some stuff done here. I don't have long to work with. I don't have much time to work with. I got to get everything I can get done while God's got me here. Why? Because I'm going to be held responsible for what I do in this life. And i got to make sure when I get to heaven, well, preacher, you shouldn't burn the candle at both ends. Well, I ain't getting to heaven with any candle left. I don't know about you. You see what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, yeah, you got to take care of yourself. you got to keep your health up. I got all that. But I don't want get to get to heaven and have a whole bunch of my candle left. And God go, really? You couldn't have burned a little more? I don't want to see that happen. The truth is, there's got to be an urgency about what we do. Why? Watch, 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 watch. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. In humility, we walk. In mercy, we revel. And in just living, we strive. You see that? If any, of, if any one of you knows the good you ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for you. I want you to hear me. And I don't want you to make any bones about what I'm about to say. If you judge somebody simply because of the color of their skin... That is sin. Because I'm making it clear to you today that Jesus died for all human beings and you must value every one of them. And if you walk out of these doors and judge someone because of the color of their skin, that is sin for you. Hear me. Make no bones about what I'm about to say. If you judge someone and their heart because of the uniform they wear or the badge they stand behind, that is sin for you. Because I am here to tell you today that God puts authorities up and brings them down. The Bible's clear on that. And we must not judge someone because of the uniform they wear or the badge they stand behind, nor must we judge someone because of the color of their skin, nor can we judge someone because of the size of their bank account or the beauty of their car. All such boasting is evil. We must walk in humility. How do we do that? Well, first, you've got to choose it. You've got to choose it. And I'm not talking about a humility that is weak. Look, if humility was weak, I would struggle all day with it. Humility is not weak. It just understands where its limits are. We must choose it. We must obey the law ourselves in humility. Humble enough, watch, to submit myself to the law of God. And we must with urgency play out our humility because the world needs to see the grace and love of Christ in action. Y'all, I got nothing against any, I got nothing against virtually anything that's going on. I'm just here to tell you, if you want to change the world, you need to walk humbly. And in walking humbly, learn to love mercy. And in loving mercy, learn to judge yourself so that you can act justly. May I pray for us? Father God, Sometimes it seems that our world is really coming apart. And sometimes the images we see on a TV screen from some news company, they tear us at our very soul. 
we see people doing wrong and people done wrong. And it breaks our hearts. So Lord, somehow teach us, teach us to be the answer, not part of the problem. I praise you, Lord, that every weekend as we gather and worship people of different nationalities and different skin colors and different backgrounds and from all over the country, different age ranges and different wealth ranges. I, I, I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord, that in our parking lot are, are, are Benzes and cars held together by duct tape. Thank God that they're all here. Now teach us to walk humbly, not just in here, but out there. Teach us to love mercy even when it's not deserved because we didn't deserve it from you. Not just in here, but out there. And teach us to submit to you so that we might act justly and use the law as a measuring stick for ourselves instead of trying to measure up everybody else. Let us choose humility. Let us be humble enough to obey. And let us urgently apply the humility you've given us. And we will give you praise. In your name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor.